Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on undergraduate abstract algebra based on my book, Algebra in Action, A Course in Groups, Rings, and Fields. Um, this is a part of the ring theory section um, of the lectures and the purpose of this lecture to talk about generating ideals. So let's get started. So um, the plan of this lecture is that I'm gonna remind you what a ring is. I have a separate video where I go into more detail on that, another video where I explain why rings are, are something that we want to study. We're gonna talk about ideals. Again, I have uh, two other videos relevant to this, the one in which we discuss the definition of ideal in some detail and why it's defined the way it is. Another one um, connects it with homomorphisms and their kernels. Um, and then in this lecture, we will also talk about what's an ideal generated by a set. We will, um, and we will in fact look at what does a finitely generated ideal in a community of ring with identity look like? I'll remind you what of all of those things mean. Um, we will also have certain new vocabulary. What's a principal ideal? What's a principal ideal ring? And what's a principal ideal domain, a PID, which in subsequent lectures will play an important role. Uh, we will also talk about simple rings. And we will prove that a proper ideal, whatever those are, cannot contain a unit, and that a community ring with unity, um, with, with identity or unity, is simple if and only if it's uh, a field. The simple means that it has no ideals other than the trivial ones, but we will go that um, in a second. So let's start by reminding you what a ring is. Again, I have separate videos that go into much more detail about the definition of rings, why we want to study rings, and so forth. I'll look those up. So uh, let's. the ring is a place where you have two operations. As an example of that is the integers. You can add and you can multiply. Or polynomials, polynomials with integer coefficients. You can add them, you can multiply them, you can subtract them. Um, polynomials don't have to have integer coefficients. Polynomials with real coefficients are another example of a ring. Um, integers mod n, again, a place where you can modulo n, you can add and you can multiply and nice properties hold. That's a ring. And so are n by n matrices. You can add two n by n matrices and get another n by n matrix. You can subtract them or you can multiply them and again, get um, n by n matrices. So um, a definition of a set is that you have a set with two operations. The operations are denoted by plus and times. And then the what you have to have is that um, together with just plus, if you just focus on the addition, it has to be an abelian group. What does that mean? That means that it has closed under that operation, it has to be associative, it has to have identity, and every element has to have an additive inverse, and it has to be abelian, which means that that operation has to be commutative. Um, with multiplication, we ask much less, we just ask for closure and associativity. Um, and uh, we also have to have distributive law. A times B plus C should be AB plus AC, and B plus C times A should be BA plus CA. In a ring, basically what you have, need to know is that you can add, you can subtract, and you can multiply, but you can't necessarily divide. And this addition, subtraction, and multiplication follow the rules that you might expect. Um, and we denote the additive identity of a ring, the thing that when you add to other things, nothing happens by zero. And the ring might have a multiplicative identity or not. If it does, then we denote it by one. That's the thing that when you add it, multiplied by other things, nothing changes. Now, some authors insist that rings should have identity. I don't. Um, those people call um, a ring without identity a ring. But but um, I'm I'm for us, a ring may or may not have an identity, and we sort of consider this slightly more general um, uh, construct um, of a of a ring with or without an identity. Okay, so now let's remind you what an ideal is. What's the definition of ideal? So you start with a ring. You're given a ring. A ring walks through the door. You have already the set R. It's non-empty, and you have two operations, and something that we call addition, something that we call multiplication. And then we have I that's a subset of R. It's some of the collections of elements of R. Now, I is an ideal of R if the following two, two things happen. Now, to be Ideal of R, another way word for that would be a two-sided ideal of R. In the case of non-commutative rings where multiplication is not commutative, uh, that will be relevant. So what do you need to have? Well, you have to need that. Uh, one thing you need is that I is a sub-ring of R. And that, all that means is that it's non-empty. It's closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. It's a ring um, all to its own. And again, remember, I don't require um, sub-rings to have ones and that's what that's so so i can say that that i is a subring of r the other thing i need is that i need to jack up 
what I expect from multiplication. Um, to just say that I is a subring of R, you need multiplication to be closed under multiplication. You need that if you take two elements of I and multiply them, you stay in I. But to be an ideal, you need more than that. You need that if you take something in the ideal and then multiply it by anything from the ring, not just from um, the world of ideal, that world of ideal, but every, anything in that ring, you still should stay within the ideal. So R times S or S times R should be in the ideal for any S in I, any ideal element S, and any ring element R. So the way I like to think about this is that an ideal is closed under multiplication, but with edges. Not just multiplying two elements in I keeps you in I, but taking an element of I and multiplying by anything in the ring um, keeps, you, uh, keeps you in I. Now, uh, why did I call it two-sided? In, in the case of not, a, a ring is commutative if multiplication is commutative. Addition is always commutative in a ring, but multiplication it may or may not be commutative. Like for example, with matrix multiplication, it's not. If it's not commutative, then uh, multiplying on the right or on the left will, will, will make a difference. And so if you just know that uh, you can take an element of ideal and on the left multiplying by ring elements and you stay within ideal, then you call that a left ideal. Um, and that would be an example of a one-sided ideal. A right ideals are defined similarly. If you multiply, if you can multiply take an element of the, any element of the ideal and any element of the ring and multiply the ele ring element on the right and, and you always stay within the ideal, then that would be a right ideal. And then a two-sided ideal or, or just an ideal is something that's both a left and a right ideal. Okay, so now uh, the subject of this lecture is ideals generated by a set. So if you start with a ring, and if you'll start with a subset of R, now this is just some a few elements maybe, maybe a lot of elements, but a subset, not necessarily a subring, not necessarily closed under anything. And what you wanna do is you wanna say, um, what is the ideal generated by that set? And I will use the, the, the notation, the same notation I used in, in group three for subgroups generated by something with these pointy brackets. So pointy brackets with X inside them will be the ideal generated by X. But what is that? That's the smallest ideal of R that contains X. And I'll explain in a second what I mean by that. The smallest, so, so you wanna generate a, an ideal that contains X, but you don't wanna overdo it. You wanna pick as few elements as possible, add it to X, to make it an ideal. Um, another alternative notation that lots of authors use is instead of pointy brackets, they just use parentheses. Um, so, so that's also, if you see that in a book, it's ideal generated by X. Now, so what do I mean by smallest ideal? First of all, I want this guy to be an ideal. Um, secondly, I want the subset X, that original set X to be inside it. So I, I'm starting with X and expanding it to make it an ideal. But the point is that if you have any other ideal that contains X, this uh, ideal generator should be inside that. So that's the way it, it I mean by it being smallest. Um, it's not like it has fewer elements because most of the time these things will have infinite number of elements, but it will be contained inside any ideal uh, that, um, um, that contains X. Um, so that, does this thing always exist? Can I always find this smallest ideal um, that contains X? Maybe... You can find a variety of different ones, but this third property um, is not going to be satisfied. And the answer is that, yes, it always does, because first of all, there is an ideal that contains X, and that's all of R. Um, but if you take the intersection of all the ideals that contain X, the intersection of any two ideals is an ideal, and the intersection of two ideals that contain X will be an ideal containing X. So if you take the intersection of all ideals um, that contain X, then that will be um, the smallest one. And you could actually take that as your definition if you would like. If you take the intersection of two ideals, that's easy to show that that's ideal because it will be a, it will still be closed under addition, multiplication, and subtraction. And if you take something in that intersection and multiply it by something in the ring, um, because that thing in the intersection is in this ideal, and it's also in that ideal, um, when you multiply it by a ring element, you still will be inside this ideal and inside that ideal, so you will be inside the intersection. Okay, now an ideal is finitely generated if it's generated by finite sets. If you can find out the finite number of elements and say, look, look at the ideal generated by these guys, it is the ideal that I like, then that ideal is finitely generated. Now I want to, um, a very useful lemma, not a very complicated one, but a useful one, that if you're in a commutative ring with identity, so what does that mean? Commutative again means that the multiplication is commutative. Addition in a ring, 
is always commutative. But if the uh, multiplication is commutative, we say the, commutative, the ring is commutative. With identity means that we have a one. We have a, we have an element that when you multiply by other elements, um, you, nothing happens. In that case, if if you have n elements walk through the door and you want to find out um, what is the ideal generated by them, then all you have to do is find linear combinations of them. I mean about it. So you take these elements a one through a n and multiply them by ring elements and add them. Any element that you can get in that form is going to be in the ideal generated by um, by a1 through an. And in fact, that will be the ideal generated by a1 through an. So you just find r1 times a1 plus r2 times a2 and so on. And you let r1 through rn range over all the ring and see what all the elements you get. And that's the ideal generated by them. So how would I prove that? Well, I have to prove those three properties of an ideal generated by something. Uh, so, so I'm asking, is this guy, J, that I'm giving it a name, J, the, the R1 times A1 plus all the way till Rn times An, where R1 through Rn range over the whole ring, is this the ideal generated by A1 through An or not? First of all, does it contain A1 through An? It needs to contain them if it's going to be the ideal generated by them. And the answer is yes, because you could take, for example, why does it contain A47? Well, you take the coefficient of A47 to be one, because it's a ring with identity it has that one. And uh, and you take the other co coefficients to be zero. And zero and one are both elements of, of a community ring with identity. And therefore, you can you can get um, A47. Um, a, a, and you can get A1, A2, all, all of them. So that's one thing. The second one is that, is this guy an ideal? And the answer is yes, because it's closed under addition. If you um, add two linear combinations like this, you get um, another one of them. If you um, if you subtract them, same thing. If you multiply them together, same thing. But even if you take a ring element, any ring element R, and multiply by these guys, like R times one of these linear combinations, you get R times R1, A1, plus R times R2, A2, all the way till plus R times R, N, A, N. And R times R1, or R times R2, or those are ring elements. So at the end, you also have a linear combination with the scalars coming from the ring and an AN. So this is an ideal because it satisfies all the conditions of an ideal. And any ideal that contains A1 through AN, well, that ideal will have to be closed under um, multiplying by elements of R, and it has to be closed under addition. Therefore, it will contain every element of the form R1, A1 plus all the way to R on AN, and therefore it will contain J. So this is the ideal generated by those. So let's look at some examples. If I start with the integers, what's the ideal generated by three? Well, it's going to be all the multiples of three, three by any ring element. So I'm going to call that three Z, three times um, every integer. That means all the multiples of three. That's the ideal generated by three. What is the ideal generated by four and six? Now Z, the integers, is a commutative ring with identity. So our lemma does apply. So uh, the ideal generated by four and six is all integer combinations of four and six. That means that any integer times four plus any integer times six. Now, what is that? Well, all such integers, if you take an integer multiplied by four and then add to that another integer multiplied by six, you always will get an even number, okay? But on the other hand, two itself, the tiniest uh, even number, is also a linear combination and an integer combination of six and more is six minus four. So two is also in the in, in this um, um, in this ideal. And um, and if two is in there, then all multiples two will have to be there. Two times any integer will have to be there. And so we conclude that um, the ideal generated by four and six is indeed all multiples of two two z. Okay. Now let's have another example the ring of co polynomials with integer coefficients. That's a community ring with identity yen. You can multiply and add polynomials and you get other ones. You have the polynomial one, P of X equals one. If you multiply by other things, nothing happens. And it's a community ring. Multiplication of uh, polynomials um, is commutative. Okay, so it's a community ring with identity. And so in, in this ring, I can ask you, what's the ideal generated by two and X? Two is a, two is a polynomial, X is a polynomial. And uh, what is the ideal generated by, by, by these two elements? And uh, uh, well, what is it going to be? By our lemma, this is going to be all the polynomials of the form 2 times p plus x times q, where p and q are just any polynomial with integer coefficients. Um, so those are if they range over all uh, polynomials with integer coefficients. Every time you change p and q, you'll get a different element. 
all of those elements together is gives you the ideal generated by two, by, by by two and x. And these are exactly the set. If you think about it, these are exactly those polynomials that have integer coefficients, but their constant term is even because the x times q. Uh, when you multiply x by any polynomial, um, you will not have a constant term. Every, you were multiplying x through a polynomial. And so the lowest term will, will have a um, x uh, uh, will have an x in it. I mean, unless it's zero polynomial. And then and and so that will not uh, contribute anything to the constants. The two times p will make sure that the constant term is even, and you will get all polynomials with integer coefficients where the constant term is even. Um, and so that's the ideal generated by two and x in the ring of polynomials with integer coefficients. Okay, now that lemma applied to commutative rings with identity, but maybe it applies more generally. Maybe I just didn't, um, like, you know, in my proof, I did use the fact that identity was there maybe, but that was not necessary. Or, or let's just see what happens with rings without identity. And we'll look at one example. So I'm gonna look at 3z. That's actually an ideal of the integers. What is it? It's the multiples of three. 0 plus or minus 3 plus or minus um, 6 plus or minus 9 and so forth. That That's that's my ring. And I'm going to ask, what's the ideal generated by 9 in this ring? So could it be that it's just 9R? You just take 9 and multiply it by every um, um, element of my ring, and, 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 and that's what you get. Maybe that's what it is. And, and certainly, um, elements of 9R will have to be in the ideal generated by 9, because if 9 is in, in any ideal, then 9 times any ring element will have to be in, in there as well. And so um, so 9R, multi when you multiply uh, elements of the ring by 9, uh, you, you, you will certainly have elements in, in, in this ring. Now, notice that we are in the, this ring of multiples of 3, so that's actually our world. Those are all the elements that we have. And if you multiply them, they certainly will have to be in nine. On the other hand, um, the ideal generated by nine, one of the other criteria is that it has to be generated by nine. It has to have nine in it. And nine itself is actually not a member of nine times R because this R does not have one. One is not a multiple of three. So if you look at multiples, multiply um, multiples of three by nine, you're not going to get... Uh, a multi, uh, nine itself, the, the, you will get multiples of 27. Okay, so in, in addition to containing nine, it has to contain nine, it has to, not, not only it has to contain nine, it has to contain minus nine, nine plus nine, nine plus nine plus nine, all of those things. And those things, we can think of them as nine times the integers. And now integers is not our ring. So nine Z, I mean, Z itself is not a part of our ring, but nine Z makes sense. It's going to be um, things like uh, zero plus or minus nine plus or minus 18 and so forth. All of those elements will have to be in the ideal generated by nine. And in fact, these multiples of nine are multiples of three. So this nine Z itself is inside three Z and it's an ideal itself. And so then conclude that um, the ideal generated by nine in three Z is nine Z. It's not nine R but it's um, um, 9z. In general, for a, a commutative ring without identity, um, the ideal generated by a certain number by, by an element will be um, something similar to this. You will have to have all the integer multiples of that element, plus to add it to all the uh, ring multiples of that element. And then that, that will form you give you the, the ideal generated. Okay. So some vocabulary principle ideal. So if you have a ring and you found an ideal, so you walked into a ring, you looked and see, ah, there is an ideal. You might ask the following question. Is this ideal generated by one element or not? If it is, then you call that a principle ideal. And principle ideals in, in rings are akin to cyclic groups um, in groups. You might ask, well, why don't we call it cyclic? Why don't we don't use the same vocabulary? Again, that's because of the historical roots of these um, uh, this topics. Group theory came in the study of symmetries of roots of equations, and um, uh, ring theory came in in trying to solve Diophantine equations. And so they just have different roots, and so they develop their own vocabulary, and um, and we're sort of sticking to that. So a little bit confusing, but we have different vocabulary. But it's sort of nice because uh, we can just impress our friends by knowing all kinds of different words. Cyclic groups and principal ideals sounds like different things. So are a ring. 
And R is a principal ideal ring, as opposed to like one ideal being principal. The whole ring is a principal ideal ring if every ideal of R is principal. Um, now recall that, uh, so one further vocabulary, that uh, we also defined when we defined rings and so on in previous videos, something called an integral domain. An integral domain is a commutative ring with identity that has at least two elements. So zero and one are different and, and no zero divisors. Um, some authors don't put that with at least two elements, but that's why I, I want that to be a part of the definition of integral domain for me. If you're not familiar with integral domains, watch my video on rings, integral domains, and fields where we define all of these things. Now, if a ring is a principal ideal ring, that means that every ideal is principal and at the same time is an integral domain, then it's called the principal ideal domain and, and, and abbreviated at PID. PID, principal ideal domain, will be pretty important um, in, in commutative ring theory, as we shall see in future videos. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Z mod 6C, uh, integers mod um, 6 has six elements, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we add and multiply these a modulus 6. And this is a commutative ring with identity. Um, it's commutative because multiplication is commutative. It has identity because one is identity. It also has zero um, as an identity, but that's the additive identity. One is the multi multiplicative identity, the word that I have a hard time saying always. Uh, so addition and, and, and Z mod 6Z with plus and is a ring. And so the question is that, what are the ideals of this guy? So the ideal generated by zero is just zero. The ideal generated by one, so for any one of these, when I want to find the ideal generated by something, I've got to multiply it by every other element. If you take one and multiply it by other elements, you get all of six mod six C. Same thing true with five. If you take five and mul multiply by every element of the ring, you do get everything back. Five times zero is zero. Five times one, one is five. Five times two is four. Five times three is three. Five times four is um, um, two. And um, and five times five is one. So you get every element of Z mod 6C back. Um, mu multiples of two, if you look, are multiples of four are gonna be zero to four. Multiples of three are just gonna be zero and three. If you take three and multiply by those guys, module six, you will always get uh, either zero or three. Um, and these are the only ideals as you can check, because if you take any two of them, either you're taking two elements in the same ideal and you stay within that ideal, all you will get the, the whole ring. And so this makes Z mod 6 Z um, a, a principal ideal ring, but it's not a PID because it's not an integral domain because it has zeros with divisors. So for example, two and three are non-zero elements that when you multiply them together, you get zero, zero again, mod six. Okay, so let's uh, ask it, look at another example. What about the ring of integers with integer coefficients? Is that a principal ideal domain? That one is a commutative ring with identity and it is an integral domain. You can't take two non-zero polynomials and multiply them and get, get the zero polynomial. And so the, the so we want to know if this is a principal ideal domain or not. As I said, it is already an integral domain. So the question is that is every ideal principal or not? In particular, I'm gonna ask you if the ideal generated by two and x is a principal ideal. That's the ideal we looked at before. It consists of all polynomials where the, the constant term is an even, um, even constant, um, and so an uh, even integer. And so we wanna know if that's a principal ideal. So what does that mean? That means that can I find another polynomial that generate just, just that one polynomial generates the, the, the ideal generated by two and x? And the answer is no, but why is that? So you need an argument for that. You can't just say, well, I couldn't find any polynomial that generate the ideal. It just doesn't seem like it could. You have to have, have an argument. So we, we do that by contradiction. If we say that, let's say that the, the ideal generated by two and X was generated by some, I, some polynomial P of X, some P of X in ZX. So some, some polynomial unknown to us was able to generate that. But what does that mean? Then first of all, that means that two was generated by that element. That means that um, because this is a commutative rig with identity, that means that two must be P of X times something in um, some other polynomial. Um, so P of X was that um, claimant that was saying, claiming that I'm the, I'm the polynomial that generates two and X, gotta be multiplied by something else in ZX to give us two. But how can you multiply two polynomials and get just get two? 
nothing else. Well, then that means that um, both of them, but PFX in particular, the guy who was claiming to be generating, either is plus or minus one or plus or minus two. If it has any excess, for example, in it, it's not going to work. If you take something with excess and multiply by another polynomial, you're not going to get two. Um, so it has to be that. But if it's plus or minus one, then um, you, then that means that it contains one. But if it contains one, it has to contain everything because you can multiply again one by other polynomials and, and, and you have to stay within that ideal generated. If the ideal generated by one or minus one is everything. And, so, and that's not the ideal generated by two and X. We know the way around. We know polynomials that are not generated by two and X. For example, the polynomial one itself or the polynomial three plus X. But what if it's plus or minus two? Well, then the problem will be that if, if this ideal is generated by two, then it also has to generate X, but then two times nothing you can't take two and multiply it by a polynomial and end up with X. I mean, the thing you would want to multiply it by is one half X, but that's not a, a polynomial with integer co coefficients. And so neither both of these uh, lead us nowhere. And so the contradiction proves that um, um, ZX is not a principal ideal domain. Okay. Now, um, uh, so let's talk about um, uh, trivial ideals. So if R is a ring, any ring will have two ideals, the whole ring, or just if you just have uh, the zero of the, of the element. Those are both uh, ideals. And, um, and these are called the trivial ideals of R. Now, if a ring is called simple, akin to simple groups, um, if it has exactly two ideals, namely the trivial ideals. In group theory, if you've studied group theory, um, simple groups are the ones that the only normal subgroups of them are, are the identity subgroup and the whole group. And, and this is sort of a similar idea that, that if you only, you only have trivial ideals, then it's called a simple ring. So you don't have really any other ideals to talk about. I am The way I'm thinking of, of things, zero is not a simple ring because it has one ideal, but not two ideals. So even though it's only ideals are trivial, I don't consider it a simple ring. That makes it easier for me so I don't have to say non-zero simple rings. Okay, so in a ring with identity, a unit is an invertible element. So I want to give you an example of what, how what we might go about general uh, trivial idea. So in a ring with identity, a unit is something that's an invertible element, invertible in multiplication sense. Every element has an additive inverse because uh, the ring with the addition is, all, is, is a group, and so it has inverses. But uh, with multiplication, it may or may not have an inverse. If it does, it's called a unit. Now, here's a lemma. If you have a ring with identity, you have an identity, and you have uh, um, you can't talk about units if you don't have identity. Um, and if you have an identity and um, um, and you have a left or a right ideal, doesn't matter, or a two-sided ideal um, with a vengeance, um, then if I contains a unit of R, then I is going to be everything. It's going to be trivial. It's going to be everything. So um, an ideal that contains a unit is going to be everything. What's the proof of that? The proof is not that hard. So if if uh, it, we are saying that I contains a, a, a unit, let's say call that U. If U is in there, then because this thing is a left ideal, now R times U for every element of R, for every ring element has to be an I. But And so among that means that because U was a unit, U inverse is a ring element. U inverse might not be in the ideal, but it will be in the ring. And U inverse times U must be in I. But if that's the case, then that means that one is in I. But if one is there, then R times one will have to be in the ideal. And that pulls in everything. So if you've got a unit, first you, you argue that because it's a unit, you have to multiply by every ring element and it has to stay in the ideal. One of those ring elements is U inverse. And that brings one in. One got to be a part of this a brotherhood if you, this is going to be an ideal. But if one is, then everything else is. So corollary of this fact is that uh, a ring with identity, a uh, proper ideal uh, does, never contains any units. Units are outside all ideals. Um, and, and so any, any ideal that you look, all the elements in it are, are not units, are not invertible, are not, have, do not have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so now we want to talk about fields. In ring theory in general, we like to translate all properties to ones about ideals, so, uh, or properties and definitions and so on to things about ideals if we can, that that will be very helpful in, in trying to sort of understand the structure of things. So what we're going to say is that if you have a community ring with identity, then R is a field, um, if and only if it's simple. And again, simple means that it has only trivial ideals. So by just look, knowing the ideal structure of a community ring with unity, you know 
that it's a field or not. So let's re I'm reminding you again that the simple means be, is that it has only exactly two ideals, the zero ideal and R, and field means that um, with addition, it's an abelian group. Well, that was a part of being a ring. Um, but if you throw away zero uh, with multiplication, it's also an abelian group. So um, you can, in a field, you can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, and you can divide by all non-zero elements and all um, uh, and, and the distributive loss hold uh, like, like any ring would. But, but the main thing is that multiplication is very nice, as nice as you can get. Um, you have to exclude zero, but as soon as you exclude zero, you actually have uh, multi more closure um, associativity. Well, you already had that, but you also have uh, identity and you have inverses. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement, so we have to prove two directions. So for the first direction, we assume R is a field and try to prove that its only ideals are um, the trivial ones and that's R is simple. But if R is a field, then every non-zero element is a unit because every non-zero element um, has an inverse. And, and um, if an I is an ideal and it's not the zero ideal, then it will have to contain one of these other elements, something other than zero, and that will be a unit. And we just proved that if an ideal contains a unit, it's everything. So we're done in that. So this really follows from the previous fact that if an ideal contains a unit, is everything. But we also have to say that, well, what if I, I just know that the ideals are, are, are the zero ideal and the full ring, why does that make that this guy into a field? Um, well, what do I have to show? I have to show, one of the things I have to show is that every non-zero element of the ring is invertible. That's one of the things I have to show. And 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 so so how, how do I know that? Well, I will look at the ideal generated by that um, by that element. Because that's a non-zero element, that uh, that ideal can't be zero. But this ring was a simple ring. The only ideals it has is the zero and the whole thing. So the ideal generated by R must be everything. But if it's everything, again, this is a um, commutative ring with identity, and we know what the ideal generated by R looks like. That was the first thing we proved. Um, that the, the, the ideal generated by R is just this little R by L, multiplied by elements so far. So it must be that there's some element that gave us one because one is in the in in this ring and it's in the ideal generated by R. So there must be an S that when you multiply by R, you get one, and that's the multiple that so that tells us that r is invertible okay so we're good there is there anything else we have to prove yes we also have to prove that um, um, uh, we have closure uh, we don't have to prove associativity because we were already in a ring and multiplication was associative um, um, and and we have an identity a multiplicative identity also we just prove invertibility but closure does need a proof you might say well wasn't the ring closed the ring was closed but here we are looking at r minus zero so we have to convince ourselves that no non-zero elements can't multiply and give us um, uh, zero. In other words, we also have to show that if you have a simple ring, you don't have any zero divisors. But x times y is zero, and x and y are both non-zero, um, then x in particular is, is non-zero, and we just proved that it's invertible, so there's an x inverse. And so you can multiply both sides of that equation, x y equals zero by x inverse on the, on the left, and I will get that y, because x inverse times x times y is y, uh, will be x inverse times zero, when we will be zero. So then y will be zero. So um, so if, if y was also non-zero, then x times y could not have been zero, and we are done with this proof. So I have uh, quite a few videos on ring theory. Uh, the ones that uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to, well, uh, the, the, there's one about rings integrals, domains and fields that gives you all the definitions that you need about rings. And, and there's another one that gives you lots of examples. There's a prior one to, that explains why we want to study rings. Um, and one about homomorphisms and kernels. And in fact, that's where ideals are, are introduced first because um, um, ideals are really kernels of uh, ring homomorphisms. I have another one where I go into much detail about different ways of thinking about ideals and, and why is an ideal uh, defined the way it is. This was the one that we just saw. And the next one is going to be about Zorn's Lemma and maximal ideals. Uh, see you next time. Please subscribe to my uh, channel. If you want uh, YouTube to uh, populate your feed with uh, my videos and like my video if you actually liked it. See you at a different lecture.
and keep hydrated.